Hello everybody, I'm James Champion. I'm going to tell you uh, today about an amazing journey I did in India in 2006. I've divided the talk up into a number of different parts. This is uh, part one. Um, I travelled to India in 2006 in the footsteps of my grandfather, F.W. Champion, F. Uh, Frederick Walter Champion. He was a forest officer and protector of tigers at a time when it was more fashionable to look at tigers down the uh, sights of a rifle than uh, through a camera lens. Um, I grew up with the stories of my grandfather um, as a child and I decided that it would be nice to go to visit the places that he had frequented when he was uh, living in India, which he loved uh, very much. Um, my aims in going to India were, first of all, to revisit areas which were associated with my grandfather in two states of northern India, Uttaranchal and Uttar Pradesh. Um, I also wanted to meet people who were involved in the same areas, both geographically and in terms of work, forest protection and tiger protection and so on, uh, who are working in that area today. Um, I also wanted to photograph scenes which were originally photographed by my grandfather to compare how things have changed uh, in the 70 years since he'd taken his photographs. I also wanted to discover if he'd left any kind of legacy behind, whether he was remembered, whether there were any visual signs uh, that he'd been there, and so on. And I wanted to take my father to areas which he remembered from his childhood. My father was born in India in 1928 and spent the first eight years of his life traveling around with his grandparents through the forests. Um, and it was obviously a, a marvelous experience to have a childhood like that. But late in 1936, he was sent home to the UK, to Scotland, where he'd actually only been once before and he was then in a boarding school and with his grandparents uh, during the school holidays. Um, and I thought it would be nice to take him back to the places that he remembered uh, from his childhood. And I was also uh, researching for a book on uh, my grandfather's life and work. Now here you can see a picture of my grandfather. This picture was probably taken when he was about 19 years old, so before he went to India. And here you can see a picture of him a little later in his life. Um, and in the next picture you can see a picture of my grandmother, so the wife of my grandfather. They married in 1923 in Lansdowne uh, in northern India. Um, she was the daughter of the Colonel of the Regiment of the Royal Garhwal Rifles and they met uh, in Lansdowne and she was a very intrepid lady and followed my grandfather very much uh, on all of his journeys and helped him very much with his photographic uh, and uh, writing work. Now I wasn't only in the footsteps of uh, these two uh, people but I also went slightly in the footsteps of my great uncle H.G. Champion, Harry George Champion. He was also a forest officer and uh, is still very well known in India today as the author of many of the books which forestry students study in their forestry courses uh, today. Now my grandfather was the developer of the automatic camera trap system and here in this picture you can see the type of uh, photographs which he managed to get even back in the 1920s and I think uh, when you look at this kind of photograph you can uh, see that uh, it was a hard job to uh, achieve uh, something of, of that quality. Even today, it would be difficult to uh, to get a shot of a of a tiger this uh, or that sharp and, uh, and 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 as well positioned as that tiger is. So what he would do is he would go to a path through the jungle where he knew a tiger was regularly uh, going back and forth by looking at the footmarks uh, or pug marks along the uh, track, and he would then set up his enormous camera and um, he would link that using a tripwire to the flash which was uh, with magnesium powder and he would then focus the camera on precisely the spot where he felt the tiger's face would be at the moment when it put its paw on the wire and he would then leave. Originally he used to sit in a tree during the uh, night and uh, wait for the tiger to come along but he got malaria and found it uh, very difficult staying in trees all night so uh, later he didn't do that anymore. And then he would go back the following morning hoping that a tiger had come along and taken its own photograph. A modernized version of the same system is still used today. But of course in my grandfather's case he didn't know whether it would be a tiger that came along, it could also have been a leopard. And here's another picture of his, which was taken also in the 1920s. And um, if you imagine, you can see that, uh, or you can, you can imagine that under the forepaw of the leopard, the wire would have passed. 
Now, of course, there were many possibilities uh, of this whole system going wrong, and probably only about 1 in 10 to 1 in 15 of the uh, attempts uh, was successful. Now, my grandfather didn't only photograph uh, wild animals by night, but he also photographed them by day. This is an unusual animal called a pangolin, and uh, you can see that uh, it has a very good defense, and it rolls itself into a ball if it feels threatened. But back to the nighttime photographs, and here we can see a sloth bear. And this picture was actually also quite historic because um, you can see two young bears, baby bears, on the back. And before this picture was taken, it was not known that sloth bears carry their babies on their backs. Now that's really basically the end of part one. Um, I hope you'll be interested to uh, listen to uh, part two. So uh, thank you very much.